great pleasure to be here with Policy Exchange. I have, as, as Dean rightly outlined, I've had the, uh, the honour of talking to people in uh, Policy Exchange events over the years and everything from local government through my time at the Home Office and uh, as Chairman of the Party, actually, and, uh, and obviously in, in Northern Ireland. And now as uh, Lord Chancellor, it's, um, it's good to have an opportunity to talk to you a bit about what we're looking at um, and what the plans are as we move forward. And, uh, and yes, we do still wear robes as Lord Chancellor. <laughs> as I found out on Thursday, having started off thinking that maybe things have moved on, I found out at my swearing-in ceremony that no, you still wear, you still wear robes. And my 19-year-old daughter will eventually forgive me for putting on a wig and a pair of tights on Thursday uh, and then putting it on Instagram. Uh, which I will be going back to do uh, again tomorrow because we have the opening of the legal year. So I'll be uh, heading back to London for that before coming back because I actually do think one of the things that we will focus on, and I'll talk a bit more about this later in the conference week, we have in our country something to be very proud of, which is a world-leading legal profession. Uh, legal services in this country actually are fundamental to everything we do across a wide range of areas. And I think sometimes the... Uh, what well, some of us might think are occasionally antiquated and a bit odd, these ceremonies and services we do actually are really quite important. I think not only to remind uh, the rest of the world but ourselves about the history of our law and how it has evolved and how it continues to evolve to reflect what we need in society. And that will continue as we go forward and that's where we are, I think, when we start to look at um, human rights reform. It was our 2019 manifesto that specifically laid out that we will update the Human Rights Act and administrative law to ensure that there is a proper balance between the rights of individuals, our vital national security and effective government. We need to do that and we need to ensure that we do that in a way that reflects our wish to reduce the ECHR's influence in our system, whilst making sure we retain our other manifesto commitment that is hugely important, which is to remain a champion of collective security, the rule of law, which obviously I have a job to protect, as well as human rights, free trade, anti-corruption efforts and a rules-based international system. And we took more action on some of this uh, just this week, particularly with regards um, to anti-corruption efforts uh, with Putin's regime and those who purport to support it. And there is a range of options for us as we go forward to explore in this area of human rights if we want to govern according to our manifesto pledge and remain absolutely true to what we promised to the people who voted for us in 2019. I think we do need to make sure that we are addressing and dealing with Section 2 uh, of the Human Rights Act, the obligation to take into account Strasbourg Court ju jurisprudence. We need to give consideration to a tighter approach that limits creativity whilst encouraging our domestic, domestic courts to have the ability to diverge from Strasbourg case law more freely, that UK courts have primacy in and for UK law. Now, more widely, when we are interpreting the human rights framework in the courts, we should always seek to prioritise protecting the public from convicting offenders during the term of their custodial sentence. That, to me, the protection of the public and looking after victims has to be key and heart to everything that we do in the MOJ. But that also plays into a wider approach, and one that I intend to take as the Justice Secretary, which is focusing on, first and foremost, the safety and comfort of convicted offenders never, ever being put over that of the safety of the public and of protecting victims. Now, there are many changes to the human rights framework that will need to be considered, both by government and wider parliament. And having been a government member of parliament during a period where the relationship between parliament and the courts has been strained from time to time, I know how important it is to make sure that if we want to take forward reform in this area, we get it right. So we deliver the outcome we actually want to achieve. It is important that we ensure that the courts recognise the supremacy in a democratic system of the decisions made by parliament. That does not conflict with the principle of the independence of the judiciary, which is Lord Chancellor I will defend to the absolute hill. But we do need to be clear that Parliament is sovereign. And if Parliament has expressed a view through legislation, then the courts should always respect that view when implementing the law that has been passed. Now this is a complex area to get that balance right, and it's one that will require a lot of work in order to make sure that our proposals are fulsome, and it is a principle that we can all support. 
The need to reduce the court's backlog is also something that has challenged a few Justice Secretaries before me as well. But due to the recent strike action as well as coming out of the COVID pandemic, we've seen that backlog go back up and become more challenging. I want to make sure that during my period of time as Justice Secretary, all possible avenues are being explored and considered. I want to be working with the judiciary, who are equally keen to see this backlog dealt with, to look at what more we can do to get that backlog back down and ensure that we're looking at every opportunity to do that. I intend to put my department to work in exploring what can be done to also ensure that we curb the use of slaps. These are strategic lawsuits against public participation. They are too often used by wealthy individuals to intimidate and silence the critics. And it's not right that money can buy legal impunity in our system. We need to ensure that we have a system here, a system of human rights that doesn't create or give cover for a council culture. We need to do everything we can to protect freedom of speech, even when it can be really, really annoying. <laughs> We can't allow people to claim their human rights are being infringed because they disagree with us. Democracy is about debate. Democracy happens because of debate. Debate means having that opportunity to say what you believe, to make a case for it, to argue for it. We all have a duty to be aware that what we say matters, to be aware that when we speak, we are talking to people and that will have an impact. We need to be free to have that debate and that conversation. We're not asking about, we're not talking about in this context, protecting um, terrorists from inciting hatred, which must always be something we have the legal ability to deal with. But we do need to make sure that people in everyday life and in public life can have their debates freely and have those debates openly and properly. And if that means occasionally the odd one of us as a politician gets a bit offended and needs to fight our own corner, that's what democracy is about. And that's worth defending as we look at the human rights and the freedom to do that as we move forward. I'll pause there. Thank you. Mm. So because of the unusual uh, circ last minute circumstances, I'm just going to take it in slightly unconventional order and put Lord Chancellor on the spotlight, as it were. With, uh, we have first tranche of questions. I'm sure there'll be many questions here. Do I see anyone from the floor? Lady there, if you only house rule, you just have to state your name and organisation. No question too outrageous. But that's the issue. Please. Do you need, sorry. By the way, could everyone hear the Lord Chancellor? Just, uh, can, anyone, can I also ask, does everyone find it a great nuisance, the background noise? Can I just see whether <laughs> there are any dissenters to this opinion so I can make representations? Is, it, is this a request to change the freedom of speech plan? No, <laughs> no it's just, uh, it's just uh, we want, I want to get a, get a flavour of opinion here so I can make representation on behalf. Madam, your Hello, question. Hello, my name is Grace De Costa. I'm from Quakers in Britain. I was from which organisation, sorry? The Quakers. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what was happening with the Bill of Rights Bill, whether that will be brought back or whether there will be other legislation to replace it. Do you want to answer that? Yeah, Spend sure. Um, so we are looking at uh, a range of things from the, what would have been in the Bill of Rights Bill, which we're not bringing forward at the moment. Uh, what we are looking at is uh, what is the right piece of legislation to bring forward some of the measures that we wanted to deal with. Uh, for example, I've just been talking about at the end of my few words there, freedom of speech. Uh, strategic lawsuits against public participation, things like that, how we do that, what's the best, speediest way of dealing with that. Um, I know a lot of people and we as a government are determined to make sure we are dealing with the issues that can uh, help us deal with the issues around illegal immigration. We're working, I'm working closely with the Home Secretary to ensure that we can put together legislation that deals with that. So those key tenements we wanted to deal with, we will deal with, but we'll probably do it in different pieces of legislation. I see there are gentlemen there, a few. Your name, I didn't just say that for the benefit of the Home Office Minister in the room, <laughs> the great Lord Sharp. Uh, Chris McKeon from the Press Association. Um, I just wanted to ask about the, you, you mentioned the strike action. Um, obviously, one of the major complaints from the Criminal Bar uh, Association is about legal aid and, and, and money. In the context where we have uh, a Treasury looking to cut funding, will you be pushing to protect and indeed increase funding for legal aid? Well, we, um, obviously, one of, these, one of the key, uh, or probably the number one, acute issue on my desk on coming to office uh, has been dealing with the bar strike. Uh, they will be going to um, ballot next week. 
Um, I am hopeful that they will uh, look at the, well, I'm confident they'll look at the proposals carefully. I'm hopeful that they will look at them positively and vote and that we will see an end to the strike. It's a comprehensive package that deals with the issues that need to be dealt with. So look, I'm hopeful we'll, we'll deal with that, which will help move things forward and actually puts the whole structure, particularly for the junior bar, in a very different place in terms of covering off some of the issues uh, and giving payment there for Section 28, which you want to see more of, to deal with RASO cases, so uh, rape and serious sexual assault cases, um, and also uh, for paperwork and, and wasted work, which has been an issue, I know, for the bar for a very long time. Uh, so wider issues around legal aid, um, we're not at the point of uh, having the, the future legal aid budget looked at yet, but at the moment, as I say, I'm very keen to ensure that we have a, uh, a judiciary that is able to work. I want to make sure we've got a judiciary and a bar uh, that's able to work in a good environment as well. One of the issues around dealing with the court battle will also be making sure that all of our courts can function properly. Um, and we are blessed in this country with great teams who work across those courts, doing the best they can to keep them functioning, and I want to make sure they've got the support that they need. If I can just ask a question that's just come in uh, on uh, WhatsApp for you, uh, Lord Chancellor, where uh, it's from Rajiv Shah, formerly Number 10, Constitution's Party, said, does the Lord Chancellor agree that it is important to ensure that our domestic courts cannot gold plate the ECHR and go beyond Strasbourg? <laughs> uh, well, uh, obviously, I first of all, as the uh, Lord Chancellor will reiterate, I do believe oh, absolutely in the independence of the judiciary. So um, I will respect and protect their independence. But one of the things I said in my opening remarks is I want to make sure that equally our judiciary is clear that f of, of a couple of things. One is that Parliament is, is sovereign, and if Parliament passes a law, our judiciary um, are delivering on that and respecting that, but also that in UK law, UK courts have primacy. Um, and if there is a reflection from Strasbourg, it's a matter for the UK courts how they interpret it. I see quite a lot. Lady at the back there, please, name an organisation, if you don't mind. Hi, um, Megan Rowland from Tear Fund. Um, my question is is to you, um, is to you, but also to the other um, panelists. Um, which is, what would you say to those who are concerned that these changes um, could have the implications? These changes could have for our standing internationally, um, and also in holding other countries accountable for human rights. Well, I, <coughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let Dean so if he, when he's going to come to the others. But look, I. Internationally, I think we are in a very, very strong place. Our legal system is respected around the world. We are number two after the US in the world, number one in Europe for legal services. I think as we move forward, there's an opportunity for us to grow that sector. It's something I'm very, very interested in, very keen to, to work on. I mentioned this in my speech at the swearing-in ceremony the other day with crypto and um, blockchain and things like that. There's, there's big opportunities for us. That is fundamentally, you are right, built on our international reputation as a centre for law and the rule of law. Um, but the rule of law is what recognises the sovereignty of Parliament. Um, so I think it is absolutely in line with our international standing that, su that Parliament's supremacy is there. That is what our democracy is founded on. And I think without that, our democracy suffers. Find what you Sorry, what are. is your question? So my question is, would you regenerate that debate um, the consultation process and see if you could come up with a legislation that guarantees the right of an individual to bring an action against another individual in relation to human right claims as against the state or against the local government authority. So if you have questions... Excuse me, sorry. So that's the you've question. Had, you've had your say. All right, brilliant. Lord Chancellor. It's a contribution. It's quite Lord positive. Chancellor. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I think I, I get it. I think, um, so as I say, what we're doing is working through all of the issues that were being considered for the um, uh, Bill of Rights, looking at how we, you know, which of those we take forward and in which way we take them forward through different pieces of legislation, whether it's through Ministry of Justice legislation or potentially through Home Office legislation, etc. over the next um, period, whether it's this session or the next session. Um, um, I think at the moment, it always sounds very simple to bring together lots of complicated legislation. I, I did a, try to do, look to doing a similar thing and have kind of did this with planning law, actually, um, when I was in uh, what was then DCLG. It is never as simple as it sounds um, because the way these things interact. And actually, when you've got limited parliamentary time, using parliamentary time to repeat legislation you've already got but to put it in a different format isn't a good use of parliamentary time. So um, I have to say I'm not somebody who's going to be proposing to the Prime Minister that while we've got legislation and I've got legislation I want to look at to do more to help victims and keep society safe, to bring out legislation that basically repeats legislation we've already got in a different format isn't a good use of um, parliamentary time. But um, 
but you, ne you never say never to looking at how you can do things better and more efficiently in the future. Thank you. Gentleman there, please name an organisation. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin Wood, uh, I'm a secondary school uh, teacher of religious studies. Um, the Human Rights Act at the moment, um, I think Article 2, Protocol 1 says includes the right to education, but also the right for parents to have their religious and philosophical beliefs respected in the education of their children. Um, bearing in mind what you just said about free speech, um, I'm wondering if you can speak to what you see as the value of that. I think there are some within the party who perhaps have more intolerant voices um, about ensuring that religious studies in schools is objective and plural. Well, I, as I say, I, I fundamentally believe in people's right to offend me. Um, and I appreciate, hopefully, with religious issues, that's not generally how people take things forward. But, you know, I have a lot of sympathy with some of the debates. I, I remember seeing a piece a few years ago from uh, Rowan Atkinson, actually, that I thought was brilliantly written around the right to be offended. Um, you know, our society develops and evolves and grows because we have these debates. And there are things we do today that are so different to what happened in the past because either our tolerance has changed in that we are more tolerant of some things, we are less tolerant of others, and it, that is evolution, that happens through debate. And if you restrict people's ability to debate and you have a council culture, then things don't move on. Um, and they become trapped in one person's view of the world, which I think is very, very dangerous. So, I, um, you know, there is always a, there's a duty on all of us in public roles, and obviously teachers particularly have this responsibility with young people to make sure that there is balance and they've got opportunity to understand what the options are. But that's a duty we have as individuals or as professionals to deliver on our professional duty. I think it's right that we keep the freedom of speech right there for people to be able to argue for what they believe in. Gentlemen there. Yes, you. Thank you for just wait till the microphone comes. Especially important in these circumstances. Okay. Uh, hello there, Ethan Green, South and West. So we've just sorry. Heard... Could you speak up a little? Of course. So Ethan Green, South and West. So we've just heard about your belief in the right of being offended. So I was wondering if you'd be looking into the Communications Act and specifically Section One Two Seven, which is currently under a lot of controversy about the fact that it prohibits grossly controversial speech and therefore means that there isn't a legal right to offend. Okay, shall we take a bunch of questions yeah. together and you can do it? So I'm just trying to get a flavour of the room because of the limited time left. I'm just trying to... <coughs> Gentleman there, please. Yes. Hi, Councillor Rob Bailey from Lancashire. Um, in regard to freedom of speech, you've recently seen the Free Speech Union be defunded by or, or have their PayPal accounts removed. Um, do you think that... Could you foresee the new legislation giving a positive right to companies, to, to individuals, to challenge that kind of thing in the future rather than have to rely on contract law? Thank you for those admirably concise questions. Two more gentlemen there, gentlemen there. Thank you. And we'll go. And how did they manage, for instance, uh, when David Cameron proposed... Uh, what's, your, what's your question? The question is, and, and it must is, be pertinent uh, to the pre Secretary of State's present responsibilities yeah, because otherwise. I wrote to him saying that you're out of order. Because you're just uh, looking at uh, the press, the press does what they like, and the parliament follows them. And then that's why the economy is not stable, because we keep changing. David Cameron resigned. I think, what's your, what's your question? Yeah, my question is, what the legislation governing the parliament, I mean... I think we've the got the message. The gentleman there, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'll keep it brief. Sorry. Name, uh, name an organisation, uh, please. Well, Ethan, um, I'm a, uh, as an individual at Aberdeen Uni, um, so I'm aware that there is legislation which means that uh, police can't go on strike. Uh, do you think that there's a case for expanding that to the legal profession uh, on the argument of you know dangerous criminals not being prosecuted uh, and therefore, uh, obviously not immediately, but in an extreme situation, uh, improving, increasing the legislation or increasing the scope of it so that barristers wouldn't be allowed to, scri to strike as well under extreme circumstances. Thank you. Do you want to take them sure. all as a <clears throat> yes. clutch, <laughs> clutch of questions, a wide potpourri there to scratch yes. a man with multiple portfolios? Yes, no, I'll, 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 I'll try and cover all of them. So, um, starting with Ethan, uh, from a good Essex based South End uh, West, where my grandparents were from uh, and lived. Look, um, I'm looking at a whole range of things around how we ensure we can do this and deliver this in a way that is, as I say, it's, for me, it's looking very, very carefully what is the outcome we want to achieve and how do we best achieve that. Um, that means being quite careful with what we do and not getting too caught up in um, uh, what sounds good on first 
uh, appraisal, but actually working through method uh, very methodically exactly what we want to achieve. So um, you'll have to bear with us uh, a little bit longer, but, that, but making sure we can give that space to people is very key, which plays very well into the point about the free speech union. I thought it was uh, very disappointing, actually, to see that kind of... Uh, people having to work through in that contractual way using contract, contract law. There is a real issue sometimes when we see, and I know this from previous jobs when I was in the Home Office as well, the frustration around seeing certain things online that um, companies can be quite slow. They're getting much better now, but they have been historically very, very slow at dealing with. And it's hard to explain to somebody why something like the Free Speech Union is being taken off PayPal when you see things that are encouraging suicide and terrorism on wide social media from big multinational global companies. Um, so I think we need to make sure that we're dealing with that as a priority rather than people's uh, access to freedom of speech. Um, in terms of your point about the Prime Minister, having been chairman of the Conservative Party, um, I know very well not to step on uh, a chairman of the Conservative Party's toes, but I'm sure Jake won't mind me saying, uh, well, the best thing we can do in the Conservative Party is make sure we stick with and back our leader. Um, we've got to make sure that we are focused on that for delivering for people. That's, and it's not an issue for Parliament, actually. It's the way the, the, the party rules work. And in terms of um, the strikes, look, I've always been personally, very much a person of view, I think, you know, we, most of our emergency services do not and cannot strike. Um, and I know from having gone through the fire brigade union strike, some of our colleagues in the armed forces always found it slightly odd that they were having to come back from Afghanistan on leave, and while they're on leave, cover for firefighters who were going on strike um, over uh, their pension age and things like that. So there, there is a, a, an issue there, but some parts of sectors can and some can't. The, I think the bar is quite different because what we, some people don't often realise is all the barristers are actually self-employed. And even the Criminal Bar Association, that's often referred to as a union, isn't a union in that strictest sense because all of its members are self-employed. Um, so we've been having discussions with the Criminal Bar Association. They will be putting this ballot to members next week. As I say, I hope they'll vote positively, but it is true uh, we do need to ensure that we're not going through this kind of thing every four years um, and that we've got a structure that means it can continue to deliver pe for people in a way that ensures that victims can see their access to justice is not being slowed down um, by this kind of action.